All right, let's talk muscle imbalance of the pelvis area. So the hips, the low back, the glutes, everything in this entire lumbopelvic region. So I want to start with hip flexion on the front. So I want to talk about it, see where they go, see the difference in the two. Typically when I've assessed someone, I have checked these out. Um, and if I feel the need to check them out, usually they're a little uncomfortable to be poked on. But I want to give a visual of where they are. So this is your iliacus, okay? It just sits in the bowl of the front of your hip and goes to the leg. It flexes the hip up. So its main motion that it does is flexing the hip, okay? When we go back and we look at the other one right here, typically when you hear the term hip flexors, people are generally lumping these two muscles together because they do end up sharing a common tendon. So they call this your iliopsoas tendon, um, but the psoas goes much higher. So your psoas comes all the way up, and it is actually the only muscle of the body that connects your leg to your trunk itself, to the low back. Everything else is either hip to leg, hip to low back. This is the only one that crosses the whole thing. So in positions where you are sitting for a long time, um, or you're having to hold a funny position, or let's say you're repetitively using it, like you're running or you're cycling or something, um, so as is almost always involved. So not only does it flex the hip, but it actually will flex the trunk, and it will also side bend the trunk because of where it connects in there. So crunches, you can think of kind of the typical crunch that you would do at the gym where you're crunching up. When you are doing more of like a leg lift or you're doing a really isolated crunch, you're getting a lot of psoas. You're also going to end up using your abdominals, so don't hear me say that those are not going to be using but those lower leg lifts tend to be working a little bit more on psoas in there. If you can see from this angle, bring it down. The other thing that it does is can side bend you. So let's get back to a normal position here. So just where it attaches on the spine, it can also side bend you some. Now it's not working in isolation, like I said, it's working with other things, but just keep that in mind for if you have a little bit of a muscle imbalance and one side is a little bit more higher tension level than the other, can predispose you to getting a little bit of that really, you can see where it attaches here, that really deep like, ache on one side of your back um, or both sides if both are pretty tight, but I just wanted to give you an overview of that. When it comes to the backside, muscles that are generally in play, the opposite actually side of the hip flexor that's usually involved, the quadratus lumborum tends to be involved, which is this guy. And it attaches from the top of the hip, also up to the side of the spine and actually to the bottom rib. So just for visualization's sake, if, if let's say we've got some quadratus lumborum irritation, that could tend to make that hip be more prone to riding up. Um, and since when we're walking, it's not like that leg's just going to migrate up. It's just going to pull. So you might get that real deep kind of right there by your dimple on your back type of ache. Um, or it might feel like you can't get a full breath without getting a little bit of sharp pain. On the flip side of that, with the hip flexor, oops, let me clear my pen. With the hip flexor being tight on this side, it might make, um, let's, let's go with this guy at least, it might make this hip look like it is rotated a little bit forward. If you can see this line of pull, if this is tight, obviously when you're walking and doing things, your leg's not just going to be off the ground, it's going to pull that hip forward a little bit. So... When this quadratus lumborum is pulling it backwards just a little bit, and this one's pulling it a little bit forward, we're starting to see some of this pattern that is building. Let's go ahead and add on the actual glutes, because that is the biggest muscle group that ends up having some of these funkiness going on. So if we add, okay, so before I add on glute max, I really want you to take note of how many smaller muscles are truly in the 
buttock area. They call it your deep six. Okay, so you got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. What these guys do is they pretty much act like a stabilizing structure for this hip joint. They do rotation. So the most common one that you're going to hear about is your piriformis because it tends to sit directly on top of the sciatic nerve. And if you can see, it actually attaches kind of on the inside of this wall of the sacrum. But what it does is its main motion is to take the hip out to the side. Okay. The other motion that it does is it rotates the hip. So it rotates, it actually can rotate in or out depending on the amount of hip flexion that you're in. But in general, we think of it as rotating externally is how we call it. So like if you're laying on your side doing a clamshell. So when we are thinking about muscle groups that can get really tight and irritable, you can get a lot of deep aching in the butt cheek. Um, this one doesn't necessarily add on to that pelvic rotation quite so much, but when the rotation can be in play, it can add a little tension level to the piriformis. And then just real quick, let's throw on, see the sciatic nerve? It says right underneath it. So you go and get a really big spasm in your piriformis, you're going to get pinching along that sciatic nerve, which can lead to sensation of hamstring cramping, calf fatigue, calf cramping, um, burning, tingling, going down the leg. Sometimes you can get all the way to the foot. Let's add on the glute, the big glutes. All right, so if we see where glute med and glute max both attach, okay? So the motion of the glute max is quite a few things. It's all gonna be working in unison together, but it does hip extension, so things like running, Things like cycling, this is your big mover, squatting, stuff like that, okay? Now, if we're looking at the glute in terms of, let's say that uh, it's not moving the leg, let's say it's just going to be pulling on the hip here. If it starts pulling on the hip, let's look at it from the side, the direction of tension and pull that it's going to have is rotating it back. Okay, so you're following along with the pattern here. So it's not that your bones are structurally going out of place or anything like that, but the discomfort and the minor pull that can show is usually driven by these muscles. And if we are starting to fire the opposite muscle groups and then really stabilize both sides, a lot of times we can negate that. So back to a full picture of if we're looking at pelvic rotation, if one side has a tighter hip flexor, okay, and tends to be rotated forward. And then if the other side has a little bit of maybe more tension in the glute max, things like that, that quadratus lumborum, it tends to give more of a tension level like it is rotating back. And the way that that displays is when I am checking out pelvic levels, when I am having you lay on your back, doing that bridge, and then I'm pulling your legs, not only am I looking at your leg length, I am looking at these bones right here. Theoretically, they should be a nice, relatively straight line between the two of them, okay? But if we add in these rotation when I go to check it, it's going to more so look like this hip might look like that ISIS is sitting a little lower than this one on the front of the hip bone. So what we want to do is we want to encourage the opposite to neutralize, if that makes sense. So the other thing, the functional leg length that can happen, let's clear the pin, is let's say you have that quadratus lumborum back here, pulling that hip up some. Um, well, that's actually oblique, but underneath that, if you have that rotation going on and you have tight muscles that they tend to be the hip hiker, okay? That means that when you go and you look at someone's legs, it's going to look like one is, air quote, shorter, but really it's not the leg itself most of the time. It's that the musculature that does the lifting of the hip 
is too tense for some reason, whatever that may be, whether that's trauma or overuse or just not even strength side to side, it will look a little shorter. That's why it's called a functional leg length discrepancy. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, typically, if you're a patient of mine and I have evaluated you and found something like this, I've given you what's called a muscle energy technique where you are either, let me take a layer of muscle off, you're going to be firing. Let's take out all these. You're going to be firing your hip flexor on one side and your glute on the other. Okay, so that should sound familiar if you are one of my patients. If you're not one of my patients and you just saw this on YouTube and you're curious, feel free. You can send me a message. Um, usually, it's easiest on my Facebook page. But happy to help.